Thank you for coming here. It's a great honor to be here in the Asia House to speak about China. Imagine you're 20 years old and you graduated from Oxford University. How many of you graduated from Oxford at 20 years old? And with a PhD. And that's this professor, Leslie Young, one of our professors, who graduated from Oxford University at 20 years old with PhD in mathematics. This is the kind of fact that we have at CKGSP. So many people don't know what is CKGSP because it's a, we have a very long name, thanks to our founder, Li Ka Chun. And many people say maybe it's a, you know, Kevin Klein graduate school business. We don't sell shorts. We sell the minds and knowledge to that. So today I would like to bring a new concept called a unicorn or dragon. Perhaps many people know what is unicorn. It's a company who grew from nothing to one billion US dollar valuation in a very short period of time, a few years. Every startup and every entrepreneur, their dream to become, is to become a unicorn. But today I would, I would like to offer you a better idea. How about became a Chinese unicorn, which I call them dragon. Why dragon? Because Chinese call them the people of dragon. And dragon is much bigger in size relative to unicorn. So that's why today I would like to build a case. Unicorn or dragon, it's your choice. So I'm gonna share with you how to tap into Chinese market for growth. So, Let's talk about some of the key economic factors, which Professor Leslie Young actually mentioned some of that. I would like to bring you back 200 years from now. Actually, Professor Leslie Young brought you even far away, you know, in the history, to Marco Polo, who went to China in 13th century, when he was only 18 years old. I'm not that ambitious than Professor Leslie Young. Let's just go back 200 years from now. In 1820, China was the largest economy in the world based on the GDP, 33%. And today, people talk about China became big, became a threat to the world. 200 years ago, China was much larger than now in terms of econo economy. But China was not a threat to the world. And we see the Europe as a whole is 27%, which is represented here. And 16% is India, and 2% is America, and the other 2% is South America. So what happened is China started to decline, thanks to a lot of foreign invasion. A lot of that is due to the Qing Dynasty decided to close the door. If you go back 200 years ago, the China was so big that China doesn't need anybody else. So Qing Dynasty says that, let's close our door because the other people is gonna copy us. The other people wanted to get into our market, let's close it. We don't need them. We're big, we're strong, we have everything. And then the British comes to China, start to knock at the door and initiate the first and second opium war. And then you have the you know, eight United Armies to invade China. Then you have a Chinese Civil War and Cultural Revolution and the Chinese economy continued to decline until 1978. About 40 years ago, a Chinese leader, Deng Xiaoping, and started to stand up and say that, let's forget about the debate about ideology, let's revive our economy. That's when China started to open we call the open door policy or reform and development. Last year is 40 years of the reform and development of China. So if you understand that, and then you can see from this curve here, China started to really take off after China joined the World Trade Organization in December 2001. And China really started to export the Made in China product to be everywhere in the world, including in Italy. Professor Lesia mentioned that in a funny way. So China started to 
to go global, but not going global in terms of technology, but rather going global in terms of trade. So Chinese GDP started to grow exponentially. And last year, China hit 13.35 trillion US dollar in terms of GDP. People ask me why you put the two decimal point there. I said, when it is trillion dollar, that decimal point is actually very large. It's more than many large you know, European countries. 350 billion US dollar. And China in the past was focused on the investment, focused on the labor supplies and growth oriented versus the profit oriented. China doesn't care. Leslie Yang just mentioned the Chinese government actually promote the government official based on the regional economic development. One of the big factors is GDP. In China, majority of the people doesn't speak English. They don't understand English. But there's one single word everybody understand. That is called GDP. Everybody know how important it is. 800 million people left it off of the poverty. That is a significant accomplishment. So we need to give China the credit for that, for 800 million people who has been left, lifted out of the poverty. And urban population grew substantially from about 18% to 58% in the past few years. According to the economists, that China will pass America to be the largest economy in the world by 2024. Now, I don't know whether they predict it right or wrong, because they tend to do a lot of prediction. Many of them are wrong. I hope this one is wrong, because I actually predict that China will be much bigger than this. So if you look at the China economic growth, last year, China represents 35% of the total global economic growth. That is astonishing. More than one third of the world economic growth come from China. And if you look at this chart, left and right, you will see here in terms of China per capita, China is six, US is 6.5 larger than China in terms of per capita you know, GDP. Now, this is very important for the United States. And that means China are still a developing economy. China still have a lot of space to grow. America is already 62 you know, southern US dollar, and China is still less than 10 southern US dollar per capita. That means China still have a long way to go in terms of catching up with America on that. On the other side, the Chinese population is 4.3 times of the US population. So now if you do a math, a very simple math, if the Chinese GDP per capita will be the same as America, let's hope one day China will achieve that. That means the Chinese GDP would be about 28 times of America. And America will be the second largest economy in the world. So this is a very astonishing. And if we see some prediction here, you know, those are real US dollar. The Chinese middle class is growing. By 2026, China would aid 272 million lower middle class population and also 233 million upper middle class people. The upper middle class people are making 20 to 50,000 US dollar, and lower middle class is uh, between one and 20,000 US dollar. So clearly you see the rest part of the world is not changing much. You know, here, you don't, you don't see any change. Majority of that come from China. So that is very big. So if you look at America, many startup, when they start to expand internationally, particularly from Europe, Europe is relatively small, and they want to go to somewhere else. Usually they go to America. Why they go to America? Because they speak English, the culture is similar, they have set regulation, and they have great business system, perhaps they know somebody there already. But anything comes good also comes with something bad. In America, it's overly competitive, there's no clear technology advantages. And also, you have to work harder there. It's very sophisticated market space. 
So I argue, why you go to America? As an entrepreneur, you should go to places where other people didn't go to, like Marco Polo. He went to China, nobody believed him. He's a great entrepreneur. He's an ancestor you know, of the great entrepreneurs here in this continent. So China has a very strong appetite for the Western brand. Look at all those brands are in China. On the other side, a lot of the Western people ask me, how come we don't see a lot of Chinese brand in America, in Europe? Now I tell them this. It's not that China doesn't have great technology or China doesn't have great talents. Professor Leslie Yang mentioned that half of the STEM worker, those are statistician, technician, engineers, mathematician, are coming from China. China has more patents than the rest of the world. Huawei mobile phone has more patents than iPhone, okay? So it's not because of that, it's because China, they just deal with their local market. They're not exporting technologies. They're not going abroad for that. They're only going abroad with trade at this point. So that's why you don't see a lot of Chinese brand. But Western brand is in China because Chinese love them. Even Starbucks coffee, look at this. When they first entered China, they asked McKinsey to do a research and then say that McKinsey said, don't go to China because Chinese didn't drink coffee. This is a tea drinking nation. But they went there saying that what if they only have 1% of the people drink coffee, what would be enough? And McKinsey made a big mistake. Chinese drink a lot of coffee. Chinese like to try new things, experiencing. It's about lifestyle. It's not about coffee. I still doesn't enjoy coffee. It's about sitting on that chair and having that atmosphere and feeling that I'm Western and I'm trendy and I'm a different kind of people than my parents. Gosh, I have two children. I hope they don't think this way. <laughs> now, Coca-Cola, what is Coca-Cola? This is a toxic drink. I encourage you, don't drink too much of it. I'm addicted to it. It's hopeless. But they do so well in China. Number one brand in China, Coca-Cola. Great name in Chinese and also English. Kentucky Fried Chicken. When I was dating my you know, girlfriend in Shanghai, I, I brought her to Kentucky Fried Chicken. Can you believe that? And that Kentucky Fried Chicken was built on the barn of Shanghai. Now it's replaced with all those great restaurants like Mr. and Mrs. Barn and Barn, you know, number three, number five. You know, I dated her in the Kentucky Fried Chicken. She was very happy and, and I've, I proposed to her, we are married now. <laughs> so now you can clap. So Chinese also need a Western technologies. Chinese bought a lot of great technology companies. Last year, even bought Syngenta from Switzerland, Volvo from Sweden, KUKA Robotics from Germany, Toshiba. You know, all those great companies. Chinese love it. China also have a lot of risk taker investors. Like Professor Leslie I mentioned, there's a lot of wealthy people. Yesterday, the money was not in my pocket. All of a sudden, oops, I have lots of money. Now you think, the money didn't belong to me yesterday, so now I do not spend money like I really made a lot of effort to earn that. So China have 12 industries for the unicorn to make. Number one is new energy. There is a lot of new, ener new energy vehicle in China is very big, is the largest market in China. AI, China invests about 50% of the total global investment in AI. Cloud service is very big, led by the Ali Cloud and Baidu Cloud. Health, Chinese spend only 5% on average per person of the American healthcare spending. So there's a huge space to move along the curve here. And FinTech, China is very big on FinTech. Chinese stop using credit card, using any other form of payment. 87% of the Chinese are perfectly fine of living a life without cash. So I was recently returned from China yesterday. I didn't bring any cash. I haven't, as a matter of fact, I haven't seen how you know, renminbi look like for quite some time. 
and I'm not interested to see how it looks like. But when I travel to this country, all of a sudden I find cash is important. And sometimes British take a card called taxless, you know, with chips. When you come close to some device, they have a ding. And everybody celebrating like, oh, we're so great. We have touchless credit card. And I always look at them like, go to China and see how much you're behind before you celebrate. And blockchain, China is very big on blockchain. Now, a lot of universities started to offer courses in the blockchain. And last year, the blockchain in China became a huge phenomenon. Online education, one of our alumni student created something called a VIP kit. Online education became the new future in China because Chinese parents are so keen about their children's education. They're willing to spend anything on that. So if you are in this sector, you know what I'm talking about, Travis. And tourism, Chinese tourism is everywhere. So don't feel annoyed with them. They bring with money. On average, in Europe, they spend about 5,000 euro per person, per trip. So they bring a lot of money you know, to spend in those countries. And also social media. China is very big on the social media. And everybody is using mobile phone. On average, Chinese consumers spend 4.2 hours a day on social media, far larger than the American, which is about 3.8. And clean tech, China is now really want to care about its environment. So government are mandating the factories, manufacturing sector to upgrade their technologies. So clean tech is getting really big. And re new retail, this is talking about new retail. Paul, where are you? You know what I'm talking about. You know, new retail is become a new phenomenon in China. It's online, offline combined. It's trying to provide the best and total experience for the consumer rather than you know, using either offline or online solution. So China is very much ahead of the curve here. Logistics, Chinese development is thanks to the logistics, thanks to the highway, thanks to the logistic company, deliver, de delivering company. JD.com was able to deliver a package from the time the consumer placed the order to the time to receive it in merely seven minutes. Seven minutes. In a Western country, you cannot imagine that, but China is doing that. It's become the very typical sort of situation in China. So I want to share with you as a summary here. The Israel is very good at doing from zero to one, and Europe is very good from zero to 10, because you are very talented in come up with great, brilliant idea. And the U.S. is good from zero to 100 because they're good, both good at idea and also commercialization. China at this point are not very good at technology development, but China is good from 10 to 100. So your technology, your idea, once you bring to China, will create a huge value and much bigger value than you would have here in Europe. So that's what I'm talking about here. Four steps to China. Many people complain about language. I say that you don't need to speak Chinese. And many Westerners go to China, doesn't speak Chinese. Actually, if you don't speak Chinese, you become very charming. And when you start to speak Chinese, they feel, oh, he's one of us. You know? So culture. Many people say, oh, it's difficult. Chinese culture, sophisticated. Professor Les Yang perhaps scared you a little bit. But I tell you, if you go to China to live there for three months, you know how to swim. The best way to teach a baby how to swim is to throw to the water, right? You go to China for three months, you will become professional. So don't worry about that. And regulation, many people say, oh, the regulation is different. Yeah, different is fine. Who says the regulation need to be the same, right? Before there's no regulation. Political system, business system, I can spend a lot of time to, to, to tell you about. Four steps to tap into Chinese market. I, I really run out of time. Now, step one, in-depth understanding of Chinese consumer. You need to understand local consumer. You cannot just go there and do what you are used to do here. So Chinese consumer are different. They buy things now with e-commerce, 
And they buy things not because they need to buy, it's because impulsive, you know, driven, you know, shopping attitude. And they have the strong established local team, high Chinese, you know, uh, workers. They work very hard, they're very talented, and they understand the local knowledge, and they listen to you. Once you're their boss, they listen to you. They have very strong execution power. So we see a lot of expats start to leave China because the local talents become very important. So don't go there just you know, looking for a partner. You can establish your own thing there. Develop the right channel strategy, whether it's the e-commerce, distributor model, franchise model, traditional offline model, and you can name it. Create an effective marketing strategy. You can use KOL, you can use Weibo, WeChat, and you can also use offline way as well. Thank you very much. I hope you go to China and you will not be disappointed if you still wait and to see and chance may not last. Thank you.